Okay, good evening. Welcome to the uh, monthly meeting of Wicomico County Board of Education. It's great to see a good turnout this evening. Lots of uh, things to talk about and do. So we'll get started. Today's meeting is being live streamed and videotaped. Videos are available for viewing at wcboe.org. As we always do, we begin by uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, and it's led by one of our fine students from Fruitland Intermediate School, Sarah Apollinas. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sarah, I just want to first thank you for doing such a great job tonight and for coming here. And we have a certificate to present you with for coming here to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance and also present you with a flag. So thank you very much for doing this for us tonight. Did you bring uh, anyone with you tonight? My mom and dad are back there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Great job tonight. Thank you, Sarah. So before we begin the agenda, uh, I want to recognize uh, someone in the crowd. We have with us tonight our former superintendent, Dr. Donna Hanlon, and her husband, I've always referred to as the first man, David Hanlon. <laughs> so thank you for attending, and it's good to see both of you. Welcome. 3.2, approval of the agenda. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Okay. 3.3. Over the last month or since we last met, we lost several colleagues from the Board of Education. Uh, we want to recognize um, them tonight with a moment of silence in their memory. Mita Smith was a teacher for 11 years, worked at East Salisbury and Wicomico High School. Jack Willier, 33 and a half years English teacher, worked at Y Junior Middle School and Bennett Junior and Middle School. Carolyn Phillips Sake Miller worked at Prince Street Elementary, uh, fifth grade teacher. Renee Deal, 28 years of service, vice principal, taught at North Salisbury, vice principal at Chipman Elementary and Fruitland Primary. Charles Cordry, a science and biology teacher for 23 years, uh, worked at Bennett Junior High and Parkside High. Shirley Ringo was a teacher, vice principal, 30 years of service, worked at Prince Street, East Salisbury, Salisbury Elementary, Glen Avenue, Beaver Run, and Pemberton. And chairman's prerogative, I'd like to add that we should have a moment of silence along with these folks for the students at UVA. Recent shooting this week, which was nothing more than another tragedy uh, a shooting on a campus. So if you would take a few minutes to uh, memory of all of these folks. Thank you. Okay, 3.4, student reps to the board, which is always a highlight of our meeting. I don't think anybody denies that. So we'll begin with Mardella High School, seated at the table with us, Naya Matthews. Welcome, Naya. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, members of the board and Dr. Stauffer. First, I want to thank Dr. Stauffer for attending one of our most recent SGA meetings. We appreciated learning about the more statistical aspect of our county's public schools. Following his attendance, we reflected on the positives and negatives of homecoming. Students enjoyed our decorating efforts, and there were mixed emotions about our DJ choice, but that is always expected due to the ever-changing music taste in teens these days. We also reflected on our very successful spirit week. In fact, our principal, Mrs. Hastings, said that it was the most school spirit she has seen since she attended Mardella. Students' most favorite day seems to be anything but a backpack day. My personal favorite was the power wheel car that a student bought. Our first pep rally since before COVID was also executed, and students and staff really enjoyed it. 
To boost spirit morale, the SGA introduced the concept of a spirit stick, in which we each in which each grade level demonstrated their best spirit and competed in games to win the spirit stick. We had a five member spirit board that actively judged each grade on their spirit wear, excitement, and outcome of each game and added up the points. The pep rally ended with the freshmen having the most points, so they now have possession of the spirit stick until our next pep rally. Though November has been a time to calm down, our SGA has been able to focus our efforts on our upcoming fundraiser this weekend. We are holding a little royalty tea party for kids in our community. SGA volunteers will be dressed as Disney characters, princesses, princes, and knights. Children attending are also welcome to come dress up and enjoy tea time, crafts, princess lessons, and night training, and a sing-along and a dance-along with princesses. Children will also have the chance to slay a dragon. We are very excited to put this event on for the children of the community. The SGA's next focus will be towards our holiday spirit weeks and upcoming holiday festivities. We plan to have a holiday door decorating contest after and offer a variety of activities during lunch. Recently, we had several students inducted into the French and Spanish Honor Society, Mu Alpha Theta, and our first Tri-M Music Honor Society. The music programs are also excited to participate in the Pokemon Christmas Parade, Cambridge Christmas Parade, Salisbury Christmas Parade, also participating in the middle school and high school winter concerts and, Mar and the Mardella Christmas celebration in the upcoming month. Our drama club will also be putting on Annie Jr. the Musical on December 2nd and 3rd. Mardella has also welcomed new basketball coaches for both the boys and girls soccer teams. We welcome Coach Dean Sullivan for girls basketball who comes to us with 30 years of experience. We also welcome Coach Tony Johnson, a Mardella alum who played as a point guard. He also comes with over 30 years of experience for the boys basketball team. Last night, we had our fall sports banquet. I want to shout out the girls soccer team, which I am part of, I'm a keeper, <laughs> who, had 20, who has 25 players and everyone received the Minds in Motion Award, holding a 3.25 GPA or above. This is a very honorable mention as it can be hard for students to maintain both sports and academics. Trust me, I know. The girls soccer team also took home the regional championship after defeating Snow Hill 2-0 on November 1st. This is our first regional championship since 2014. Finally, I have worked alongside middle school teachers to successfully start our school's first ever middle school SGA. They recently had an after-school dance that many students attended, and the National Honor Society is also working alongside them to throw a winter formal for middle school students as well. We are looking forward to the outcome of this event, as the middle school has not held a dance since prior to COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Naya. From Parkside High School, Daphne Min. Hello? Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Dr. Stauffer and members of the board and guests. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Stauffer for... <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to switch mics for you. <laughs> Sorry. Start over? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good evening, Dr. Stauffer and members of the board and guests. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Stauffer for also dropping by our school to meet up with our student government. All, all our classes. Oh, sorry. Um, the meeting went extremely well, and he provided us with, ver with very infor informative data and plans for the future, and all of our members were extremely appreciative of, it, of his presence. Our, all our class officers are also planning various fundraisers to raise money for their classes, like the annual bonfire and yard sales held by our senior class. Our fall sports season will be wrapped up, was wrapped up it's um, last Friday with our boys soccer team playing in the state semifinals, football team competing in the regional semifinals, and volleyball also playing in regionals. Everybody, f all, oh my god, sorry. <laughs> all teams fought and played well. Winter sports tryouts also began today, and we're hoping to start our winter season strong. Our Parkside's marching band also competed in their final competition at States at Towson University with their highest score of the season and placed first in color guard for their division. Recently, four members of the Parkside Orchestra also performed for Dr. Stauffer and other distinguished members at the Maryland Negotiation Service 50th Annual Banquet at the Ocean City Fontainebleau Hotel. Our talented musicians were Adithi Abalash, Brianna Truitt, Rihanna Danake, and Mary Shaw, and they all sounded amazing. And at our school, thank you Dr. <laughs> Stauffer, Dr. Rager, and the Facilities Department for the new athletic storage building that is currently being built on site. Everybody's having a lot of fun watching it outside. 
um, it will become an extremely beneficial facility for our athletics program. We also had our fall program advisory committee pack dinner and meeting for our CTE towards the end of October. It was well attended and a great opportunity for our business partners to collaborate with our CTE programs. We also had a staff costume contest at the end of October. Our social studies department won first place with a Star Wars theme and donated their proceeds to the Title Health Foundation's behavioral health campaign. Step up programs have also begun at Parkside with over 100 students in attendance. Step Up is, an, is a place for basic tutoring and enrichment activities for students after school. And since preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Program has recognized commended students for 2021 based on their National Selection Index score of 207 or higher, Parkside has had two, two such students. And while those students didn't make it to the semifinal round, they are to be commended for their exceptional academic promise. These students were Jeffrey Mueller and myself. <laughs> Uh, for career preparation, we also have continued to have several colleges visiting the school to inform juniors and seniors about the college admissions process. We also had SU on-site admissions on November 10th, and 26 students were accepted on-site. We also have ASVAB testing coming up on December 2nd. And as we are reflecting on our data points at the end of Term 1, we feel the need to recognize that approximately 30% of our students are enrolled in AP and or dual enrollment classes, and one of our major goals for our ILT, Instructional Leadership Team, is to increase enrollment and success, successful completion in both. And the percentage of our honor roll students this term has been 60%. Thank you very much. Thank you. From James M. Bennett High School, Kara Lewis. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Stoffer and fellow board members. It's a pleasure as always to be here and share what the students at JMB have been up to this past month. Early in November, we hosted our fall blood drive. Our sports teams have been competing in playoffs and I'm happy to shout out two cross country runners who qualified for states, Zoe Boyd and Amin Al Nasiri. We've been able to engage with the community this past month by collaborating with Pinehurst Elementary at a trunk or treat event where every student group, almost many student groups, showed up and let their actions and attitudes show what it means to be a Clipper. Within the school, the students and staff have been working diligently together to engage in more collaboration. Every student received a trusted adult form to not only cultivate more relationship between students and staff, but also to give any struggling student a solid support system. Administration has also been making successful efforts to get participation from and engage more students in initiatives such as anti-bullying projects. Within the SGA, we've been taking lots of steps forward to increase participation, both among different groups in the school and in our school's role in state student matters. Maryland's student member of the Board of Education, JMB's very own Marin Thomas, will be the sole representative of the Eastern Shore at the Maryland Association of Student Councils this Saturday at their meeting. Our SGA is working to get even more people involved. School-wide, we as an SGA have officially established our first ever Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Right now, we're making plans to get native Creole and Spanish speakers involved in the SGA. Their voices are too often not heard, so they will help us to ensure that every student at JMB is being represented and listened to, and they will also work as translators to make every SGA event and notice accessible to as many people as possible. We look forward to the coming months and all that we will accomplish together as one united school. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And from Wicomico High School, Julia Matthews. A little tall. <laughs> All right. Good evening, board members and guests. My name is Julia Matthews, and I am honored to be Y High student representative at this meeting as I share Y High's most recent rep accomplishments. Fall sports have come to an end after a wonderful season. Football ended their season after making it to into the second rounds of playoff. The first playoff game against Queen Anne's ending with a win, and the second playoff game uh, being the last game of the season against Kent Island. But the season isn't done just yet for all of our players. Seniors Darius Foreman, Malik Leatherberry, Kurt Thomas Jr., Jabez Baptiste, Chris Wells, Jaden Handy, and Makai Johnson have all been chosen for the Crab Bowl and will be joined by our head coach, Isaiah Taylor, as he coaches the team. Unified Tennis has also ended their season strong, landing third in states. The Tribe Marching Band competed in the state's championship at Towson University and they were awarded fifth place and received great feedback and were able to see their improvement all over the year. We are excited to, for our new season to begin, including the performance season for the band, orchestra, and chorus, and winter sports. 
SGA has successfully held our first indoor homecoming since COVID and our first pep rally. We had amazing turnout for both events. At pep rally, there was some of the most participation we have had in the past few years with both the students participating in the games like tug of war and musical chairs and more, as well as those in the audience. The turnout for homecoming dance was a phenomenal event with almost 500 students in attendance. Next week, we'll be handling <coughs> Holding, I believe, holding our one of our first annual blood drives with the help of Blood Bank of DeMarva. We are excited to have the Blood Bank of DeMarva's bus back this year. Also coming up, we have our first bingo, Bingo All the Way. Our bingo will be taking place on December 1st at the Willard Science Club. Contact me if you would like to buy a ticket supporting my high. <laughs> National Honor Society has adopted a fifth grade class from Glen Avenue Elementary School. In October, we provided fresh apples with caramel for a fall treat. This week, for November, we are delivering paper towels, disinfectant wipes, tissues, and hand sanitizer, necessary supplies to ward off those winter illnesses that are on the rise. We are also filling out, we have also filled out get to know me sheets, talking about our favorite things to do, favorite colors, books, movies, and subjects. And after receiving their get to know me sheets, we were able to write them personalized notes to send with our uh, this week's stuff. Uh, we are also planning our volunteer activities for the holiday season. We will be continuing the Angel Tree Project, the Salvation Army, as well as bell ringing. We also are working in collaboration with the JCs for the first time to pick out Christmas presents for children. We are ecstatic to start the new things and continue those from the past. As our first marking term has come to an end, our tribe after school program, also known as TAP, numbers have been increasingly, increasingly steady. <coughs> the numbers of the students participating in many different after school tutoring and enrichment programs like cool leads, chess clubs, Dungeons and Dragons, gardening club, and many more have been strong. Before our Thanksgiving breaks can begins, cool will be having a Thanksgiving feast that they have prepared themselves, including turkey, mashed potatoes, macaroni, and cheese, green bean casserole, and delicious pumpkin pie. We hope to continue to see these numbers once we come back from break. In order to provide meals and to families in need, YHI has partnered with the local Department of Social Services, and we are honored to have provided six families with Thanksgiving meals. This is a great way to enable families in our community to celebrate Thanksgiving with these delicious meals. YHI is looking forward to coming back from break and continuing to achieve amazing things. Thank you for your time. I look forward to sharing what we accomplish next, and I hope you have a great night and a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you to all the uh, student reps to the board. Thank you very much for your report. So the next items on the agenda, 3.5 to 3.8, are tributes to some retiring board members, Tanya Laird-Lewis, Michael Murray, and Don Fitzgerald, and retiring building commission member, Mr. Wayne Strausberg. And at our next meeting, we will recognize another retiring board member, Ms. Ann Suthowski. So do we want to go up there? Okay, so I have the pleasure of reading a tribute to Mr. Wayne Strausberg. And in my previous position of Chief Finance and Operations Officer, I was also a member of the School Building Commission. And in that commission, there are a number of discussions that you uh, can only imagine about all of the details and plans that go into the construction projects that we have here in Wicomico County Public Schools with our 26 uh, school facilities. So Mr. Strausberg has always been a dedicated member of that commission and really just a strong supporter for our school system throughout his time and work uh, with county government. So I want to personally thank him for all of the time that he has put into the school system and the difference that he has made. So a tribute to Wayne Strausberg, whereas Wayne Strausberg served Wicomico County with loyalty and integrity as a member of the School Building Commission from August 2013 through his retirement effective October 1st, 2022. 
and whereas he unselfishly gave of his time, his talents, and his expertise and made a difference in helping to improve and expand the school construction and renovation program for school facilities throughout Wicomico County so that the taxpayers of Wicomico County could be assured their money is used wisely on functional and sustainable buildings that meet the needs of today yet provide flexibility for the future. And whereas he modeled commitment and dedication to long-range plans for renovating school facilities and building new school facilities to improve the quality of education in all Wicomico County school facilities with projects at almost all Wicomico school locations. And here we go. Including Beaver Run Elementary, Charles H. Chipman Elementary, Del Mar Elementary, East Salisbury Elementary, Fruitland Primary, Fruitland Intermediate, Glen Avenue Elementary, North Salisbury Elementary, Northwestern Elementary, Pemberton Elementary, Pinehurst Elementary, Prince Street Elementary, Westside Intermediate, Westside Primary, West Salisbury Elementary, Willards Elementary, Wicomico Early Learning Center, Bennett Middle, Pittsville Elementary and Middle, Salisbury Middle, Wicomico Middle, the James M. Bennett Auditorium, James M. Bennett High, Mardella Middle and High, Parkside High, Wicomico High, Choices Academy, Wicomico County Stadium, and the Central Office of Wicomico County Public Schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education express their appreciation to Mr. Straussberg for his role in supporting public school construction and working to help improve school facilities and for his key role in the collaboration of the Wicomico County Board of Education, Wicomico County Council, Wicomico County Executive, and the community, which all work together on the School Building Commission to evaluate plans and recommend the provision of resources to support the school system's capital improvement program as needed and be it further resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education publicly acknowledge and thank Mr. Straussberg for his many years of dedicated service to the School Building Commission and through it to public education in Wicomico County, which will benefit now and for many years to come, and be it further resolved that a copy of this tribute to Mr. Wayne Straussberg be spread upon the minutes of the Wicomico County Board of Education meeting this 15th day of November 2022. Thank you so much for your many years of support. No, by the time I get to the third one, I probably need you to hold. I'll be tired. <laughs> They've already recognized that I should be on Medicare this meeting. So, so this is a tribute to one of our bo retiring board members, Tanya Laird Lewis. Whereas Tanya Laird Lewis has served the Wicomico County Board of Education and Wicomico County Public Schools since 2019, initially appointed to the board of the Wicomico County Council to fill a vacancy, then elected as a board member in 2020. And whereas Mrs. Laird Lewis has consistently supported the mission of the school system to provide all students an educational foundation and a set of skills which will enable them to become responsible and productive citizens in our society, has consistently been both an advocate for and role model of the importance of reading and has demonstrated a strong commitment to the students, families, and staff of Wicomico County Public Schools, as well as to Wicomico County and its residents, businesses, and communities. And whereas she has created relationships with many in the school system and community, including students, parents, and guardians, teachers, principals, staff, employee groups, and associations, and leaders and members of government, civic, business, and faith-based organizations, and public and higher education, has supported continuous improvement through each superintendent's strategic plan, has helped prepare Wicomico County public schools well for the blueprint of Maryland's future, 
has participated in and contributed to various committees and boards, including Career and Technical Education, CTE, Advisory Committee, Curriculum Council, and School Health Council, has represented the Board of Education and School System to local and state elected officials, and at community and school system events, and much more, and whereas she fulfilled one of the greatest responsibilities of a board member by taking an active role in the school system search for a new superintendent of schools in 2022, assisted in the improvements to areas outlined in each superintendent's strategic priorities to include implementing high-quality universal pre-kindergarten programs in all primary schools, recognizing and supporting the importance of kindergarten readiness, expanding education programs for middle schoolers with the ongoing expansion of the Next Gen STEM Academy at Salisbury Middle School, improving the graduation rate, expanding CTE opportunities, working to ensure college and career readiness for all students, increasing dual enrollment and early college opportunities for students, enhancing the new teacher induction program in conjunction with the Board of Education, and negotiation teams, assisting in negotiating the largest pay increase ever for employees of Wicomico County Public Schools to support recruiting and retaining a high-performing staff, providing leadership to encourage and support teachers to become nationally board certified, ensuring a system-wide focus on school safety for all students and staff through policies and procedures that reinforce this goal, and whereas during her time on the board, Mrs. Laird Lewis has supported each superintendent of schools in effectively and safely leading the school system, especially through the many challenges of a global pandemic, including the provision of effective virtual learning for all students and the creation of the continuing option of the blended virtual learning program, supported increasing the technology footprint of the school system and assisted in securing funding for a one-to-one -one device ratio for all students been instrumental in supporting applications for various budgetary and financial awards, including the Government Finance Officers Association and the Association of School Business Officials International Annual Awards, encouraged food services initiatives such as Maryland Meals for Achievement, Community Eligibility Program, and the Grab and Go Breakfast Program. And whereas she has been a strong supporter of school construction projects by advocating for capital funding for the Wicomico County Board of Education's Capital Improvement Program as needed, assisted with and supported the completion of Central Air in all WCPS schools, has willingly devoted her time and energy as a member of the board to the improvement of aging facilities through many re renovations and construction projects involving every Wicomico County public school, including major projects at Del Mar Elementary School, Parkside High School, Shoemaker Complex, Wicomico County Stadium, Beaver Run Elementary School, the major renovation additions now underway from Ardell Middle and High School, the expansion, renovation of the central office, and the start of planning for a new Fruitland Primary School. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education express their appreciation to Mrs. Tanya Laird-Lewis, whose expertise and passion for serving on the board included being a parent of two students in Wicomico County Public Schools a former Wicomico substitute teacher, a public and private school science teacher, and a PTA officer for Willards and Pittsville Schools for her three years of service to Wicomico County students, families, staff, and the community as a Wicomico County Board of Education member, and be it further resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education, on behalf of the entire Wicomico County public school system, publicly recognize and express their appreciation and gratitude to Mrs. Laird Lewis for her contributions during her three years of service as a board member, and be it further resolved that a copy of this tribute to Mrs. Tanya Laird Lewis be spread upon the minutes of the Wicomico County Board of Education meeting this 15th day of November 2022. Tanya. <laughs> first met Tanya when I coached youth soccer against her father, whose her younger brother played against one of my sons, and I could hear her in the bleachers, but she was never cheering for my team, so <laughs> I've been glad to have you on my team for three years. Thank you. Well, just because my term on this side of the table is done, this is not the last you're going to see um, or hear of me, because I still... Do you have two children? Um, so I will be taking a seat on the other side 
supporting our students in our county, even though it's not as a board member. Thank you. So our second tribute is to Michael G. Murray. Whereas Michael G. Murray has served the Wicomico County Board of Education since 2017, has served as the board vice chairman since 2020. And whereas Mr. Murray has consistently supported the mission of the school system to provide all students an educational foundation and a set of skills which will enable them to become responsible and productive citizens in our society and has demonstrated a strong commitment to the students, families, and staff of Wicomico County Public Schools, has connected CTE automotive technology students with experiences with classic cars through his involvement with the Delmarva Pontiac Oakland Automot Automobile Club International, and whereas he has created relationships with many in the school system and community, including students, parents, and guardians, teachers, principals, staff, employee groups, and associations, and leaders and members of government, civic, business, and faith-based organizations, and public and higher education, has supported continuous improvement through each superintendent's strategic plan, has helped prepare Wicomico County Public Schools well for the blueprint for Maryland's future, has participated in and contributed to various committees and boards, including the Board Policy Review Committee, Audit and Budget Committee, Maryland Association of Boards of Education, Legislative Committee, CTE Advisory Committee, Delmar Board of Education Representative, Curriculum Council, and School Health Council, has represented the Board of Education and School System to local and state elected officials and at community and school system events and much more. And whereas he feel, fulfilled one of the greatest responsibilities of a board member by taking an active role in the school system search for a new superintendent of schools in 2022, assisted in the improvements to areas outlined in each superintendent's strategic priorities to include implementing high quality universal pre-K programs in all primary schools, recognizing and supporting the importance of kindergarten readiness Expanding education programs for middle schoolers with the creation and expansion of the Next Gen STEM Academy at Salisbury Middle School, improving the graduation rate, expanding career and technical education opportunities, working to ensure college and career readiness for all students, increasing dual enrollment and early college opportunities for students, enhancing the new teacher induction program in, con in conjunction with the Board of Education and negotiation teams, assisting in negotiating the largest pay increase ever for employees in Wicomico County Public Schools to support recruiting and retaining a high-performing staff, providing leadership to encourage and support teachers to become nationally board certified, ensuring a system-wide focus on school safety for all students and staff through policies and procedures that reinforce this goal. And whereas during this time on the board, Mr. Murray has supported each superintendent in effectively and safely leading the school system, especially through the many challenges of a global pandemic, including the provision of effective virtual learning for all students and the creation of the continuing option of the blended virtual learning program, supported increasing the technology footprint of the school system and assisted in securing funded for a one-to-one -one device ratio for all students, been instrumental in supporting applications for various budgetary and financial awards, including the government Finance Officers Association and the Association of School Business Officials International Annual Awards, encourage food services initiatives such as Maryland Meals for Achievement, Community Eligibility <laughs> Program, and the Grab and Go Breakfast Program. And whereas he has been a strong supporter of school construction projects by advocating for capital funding for the Wicomico County Board of Education's capital improvement program as needed, assisted with and supported the completion of Central Air in all WCPS schools, has willingly devoted his time and energy as a member of the board to the improvement of aging facilities through many renovations and construction projects involving every Wicomico County Public School, including major projects at Del Mar Elementary School, Parkside High School, Pinehurst Elementary School, West Salisbury Elementary School, Wicomico School Wellness Center, Wicomico County Stadium, the relocation of Choices Academy, Beaver Run Elementary School, the major renovation and additions now underway from Ardella Middle and High School, an expansion renovation of Central Office and the start of planning for a new Fruitland Primary School. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education express their appreciation to Mr. Michael G. Murray, whose expertise and passion for serving on the board included being the son of a 39-year Wicomico educator, being a 1976 graduate of Wicomico High School, 
being a retired educator with 35 years experience in Delaware schools as a teacher and school administrator, and being a former substitute in the school system for his five years of service to Wicomico County students, family, staff, and the community as a Wicomico County Board of Education member, and be it further resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education, on behalf of the entire Wicomico County public school system, publicly recognize and express their appreciation and gratitude to Mr. Murray for his contributions during his five years of service as a board member and officer, be it further resolved that a copy of this tribute to Michael G. Murray be spread upon the minutes of the Wicomico County Board of Education meeting this 15th day of November, 2022. Mr. Murray. So Mr. Murray and I went to Y Junior at the time, now Y Middle, and Y Comico High School. And I believe he was in the Beaver Run Elementary with my wife back in the 60s. So we, 70s, sorry. Glad my wife didn't hear that, but we go way back. She's probably watching. <laughs> Our final tribute to Donald L. Fitzgerald. Whereas Donald Fitzgerald has served Wicomico County Public Schools and the Wicomico County Board of Education faithfully and loyally since 2009, both as an appointed in 09 and 14 and then as an elected 2018 board member and served as the board vice president for two years, 2013 to 14, board president for three years, 2015 to 17, and board chairman for 2000, for two years, sorry, 2018 to 2019. And whereas Mr. Fitzgerald has consistently supported the mission of the school system to provide all students an educational foundation and a set of skills which will enable them to become responsible and productive citizens in our society, and has always emphasized that it's for the students. When the board discusses any matter, matter and has demonstrated a strong commitment to the students, families, and staff of Wicomico County Public Schools, as well as to Wicomico County and its residents, businesses, and communities. And whereas he has created relationships with many in the school system and community, including students, parents, and guardians, teachers, principals, staff, employee groups, and associations, and leaders and members of government, civic business, and faith-based organizations, and public and higher education, has actively supported youth extracurricular activities and athletics through his advocacy as well as his hands-on service with the Optimus Club of Salisbury and James and Bennett High Softball, has supported continuous improvement through each superintendent's strategic plans, has helped prepare Wicomico County Public Schools well for the blueprint for Maryland's future, has participated in and contributed to various committees and boards, including the Audit and Budget Committee, Maryland Association of Boards of Education Legislative Committee, Career and Technology Education Advisory Committee, Delmar Board of Education Representative and School Building Commission, has represented the Board of Education and School System to local and state elected officials and at community and school system events and much more. And whereas Mr. Fitzgerald has twice fulfilled one of the greatest responsibilities of a board member by taking an active role in the school system search for a new superintendent of schools in 2016 and 2022, and has supported the leadership of all superintendents of schools with whom he has served as they have worked to make improvements in areas to include implementing high quality universal pre-K programs in all primary schools, recognizing and supporting the importance of kindergarten readiness, expanding education programs for middle schoolers with the expansion of the TAD program for grades six to eight, and the creation of the Next Gem STEM Academy at Salisbury Middle School, improving the graduation rate, expanding CTE education opportunities, 
working to ensure college and career readiness for all students, increasing dual enrollment and early college opportunities for students, enhancing the new teacher induction program in conjunction with the Board of Education negotiation teams, assisting in negotiating the largest pay increase ever for employees in Wicomico County Public Schools to support recruiting and retaining high-performing high staff, providing leadership to encourage and support teachers to become nationally board certified, ensuring a system-wide focus on school safety for all students and staff through policies and procedures that reinforce this goal. And whereas during his time on the board, Mr. Fitzgerald has supported each superintendent in effectively and safely leading the school system, especially through the many challenges of a global pandemic, including the provision of effective virtual learning for all students and the creation of the continuing option of the blended virtual learning program. Supported increasing the technology footprint of the school system and assisted in securing funding for a one-to-one -one device ratio for all students been instrumental in supporting applications for various budgetary and financial awards, including the Government Finance Officers Association and the Association of School Business Officials International Annual Awards. Encourage food services initiatives such as Maryland Meals for Achievement, Community Eligibility, and the Grab and Go Breakfast Program, and guided the effective and efficient relocation of the central office to Northgate. And whereas he's been a strong supporter of school construction projects by advocating for capital funding, for the Wicomico County Board of Education's Capital Improvement Program as needed. Assisted with and supported the completion of Central Air and all WCPS schools, has willingly devoted his time and energy as a member of the board to the improvement of aging facilities through many renovations and construction projects, including every Wicomico County public school, including major pro projects at James and Bennett High School, the James and Bennett Auditorium, Bennett Middle School, Del Mar, Del Mar Elementary School, Parkside High School, Pinehurst Elementary School, West Salisbury Elementary School, Wicomico High School Wellness Center, Wicomico County Stadium, the relocation of Choices Academy, Beaver Run Elementary School, the major renovation and additions now underway for Mardella Middle and High School, the expansion renovation of Central Office, and the start of planning for a new Fruitland Primary School, and now therefore it be resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education express their appreciation to Mr. Donald L. Fitzgerald, a 1964 graduate of Wicomico High School and a parent whose children also attended Wicomico schools, with one of them becoming a Wicomico teacher and coach, a Vietnam War veteran, and a 37-year employee of E.I. DuPont, whose Board of Education service came years after his retirement for his long-term commitment to supporting the education of all Wicomico County students, families, staff, and community, regardless of any personal health issues he faced, and be it further resolved that the members of the Wicomico County Board of Education, on behalf of the entire Wicomico County public school system, publicly recognize and express their appreciation and gratitude to Mr. Fitzgerald for his contributions during his 13 years of service to Wicomico County students, families and the community as a board member and officer and be it further resolved that a copy of this tribute to Mr. Donald L. Fitzgerald be spread upon the minutes of the Wicomico County Board of Education meeting this 15th day of 2022. He said he just wants to thank Dr. Hanlon. And so I met Mr. Fitzgerald what, in the early 90s. He was at Optimus Club, and they used to run the 9-10 baseball league there. They weren't at the various little league fields. And so he was in charge of that, and I got involved with my oldest son and started coaching the team. And then uh, as I was coaching, sometimes I would razz the uh, umpires, and then this big <laughs> hulk of a man would come out and say, <laughs> Sir, would you like to umpire? And I said, no. So that's how we first met. And then I was at Little League at West Salisbury after that. So we were friends after that for a long time through baseball and then served on the board. But what I'd like to say, Mr. Strasburg, thank you very much for your service on the Building Commission. And to three of our retiring board members, thank you very much. 
I'm sure there'll be more said later under board reports, and then in December we'll recognize Miss Ann. So thank you. So we're at 3.9 superintendent's report. I'll rest my voice. <laughs> Do that. There's some water there. Take advantage of that. And I, I too, would just like to take a moment uh, and thank uh, Dr. Hanlon for being here uh, to support uh, the board members and also, of course, uh, all of the staff that are here as well. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Strasburg and um, being here and supporting us in the School Building Commission all those years. And over the pandemic, I remember how many times we talked uh, on our, our cell phones and, and getting through that and all the support that you've offered this school system in so many ways uh, throughout the years. And just again, take an opportunity to really thank all of the board members, uh, particularly Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Murray, Ms. Lewis, and Ms. Suthowski uh, for your support uh, as uh, this will be uh, the last meeting uh, that you'll be with us in that official capacity, but I know it will not be the last time that you support this school system. So. Thank you all so much uh, for your support as well. We appreciate it. So with the, for the superintendent's report, I just would like to start with junior achievement. Uh, we have three individuals that are here, Jamie Hayes, we have Kate Bliley, and we also have Chelsea Selby uh, that are here from junior achievement. And I have the opportunity now as new superintendent to be on the board for junior achievement and just personally firsthand seeing how many wonderful things that they do for the school system, the way that they support our students through financial literacy and also some of the amazing things uh, that are coming with the new Junior Achievement Finance Park for our, our local community. Uh, I just uh, felt like they needed to come and share these things not only with our board members but really with the community as whole. So I will turn it over to them. Awesome. Well, thank you all so, so very much. And obviously, wonderful to see Dr. Hanlon. Um, she was an integral part of a lot of the work that has been preceding what we're going to present to you today. So, so glad to see you as always. And to our outgoing board members, um, thank you for all your support. We really um, appreciate. And to the SGA presidents, you guys are making me exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had a lot going on, but <clears throat> might need to rethink that. But thank you so much. So we're going to be quick today and just give you an update of what's currently going on in the school system so you can have an update from there. And then we'll talk a little bit about the future of JA. So I will pass it on. Thank you, Jamie. Hi, everyone. I'm Chelsea Selby. I am the program manager at Junior Achievement, and I help uh, the principals and curriculum supervisors and teachers kind of plan out the year and go over the programs with them. So I just wanted to give everyone a quick overview of what we're currently implementing, Im implementing in the school system currently. Um, so JA Our City is what we do in third grade, and that program talks about how money moves within the economy. So they're learning about the options they have with their money, so if anyone's ever stood in in one of those programs it's the earn save spend donate um, so that is third grade currently fourth grade is our region and those students are learning about entrepreneurship and the traits and characteristics that entrepreneurs have along with supply chain and regions and all of that kind of stuff that makes a economy happen and then finance park finance park virtual is our seventh grade program I've had a great opportunity with Dr. Rigor last year to work on that. I miss you this year. <laughs> I'm sure you don't miss me, though. <laughs> um, so in that program, students are learning how to be an adult. So essentially, they're getting adult 101. So they're budgeting for 18 different line items. So food, what it costs to you know buy groceries, go out to eat. Um, paying their loan, buying a car, buying a house, all sorts of stuff like that. And that's one of the programs that will be taking place at the JA Center, which uh, Kate and Jamie will talk a bit about. And then JA Inspire, I'm sure many of you have heard about this amazing event that we put on for our eighth graders taking place March 15th and 16th this year. And that's really a career exploration um, 
event where students can learn about the different opportunities within our region right here instead of moving off of the shore. And then stock market challenge is something new that we're trying this year that'll be in high school grade levels and students will learn um, exactly how to kind of invest in the stock market and learn about investing and all of that good stuff. So students will have a curriculum beforehand, learn all of the ins and outs, complete a simulation, and then um, do the in-person event to test their skills. So I'm going to pass it to Kate. A good idea. Yeah. <laughs> good evening. I'm Kate Bliley. I'm Vice President at Junior Achievement. Um, I just wanted to share a few things about our program implementation. Um, as Chelsea mentioned, we work with the curriculum team, and our goal is that every student in these grade levels gets to participate. So every program that Chelsea just mentioned is implemented grade level wide, with the exception of the Stock Market Challenge. It's a pilot program, so brand new, um, with fewer students. But every other grade level, every student, every teacher, every school gets that program. Um, so that way we're reaching all of our students, um, and we just appreciate all the work of the curriculum team at Wicomico Schools. I also wanted to share we are back in with uh, volunteers in classrooms this year. It's been a while since um, 2019, I think, maybe January of 2020 a little bit, but um, we're excited to be back. So you'll see our team out and about, whether that's community events, PTA meetings, business um, presentations, recruiting volunteers to get in the classroom. So I know Mr. Malone is a faithful volunteer each year, and I'd <laughs> invite anyone um, who wants to spend some time in a classroom to volunteer. And uh, it's a great opportunity to get to know some students, but also um, impact their futures. So new programs this year is uh, JA Inspire to Hire. Uh, as you know, it's normally an eighth grade program. We really want to get our high school students more involved. So this is an opportunity that they can come and learn about internships, actual job openings. You know, they're more of the age where these businesses can hire them or they're getting close to that with graduation. Um, so it's a great opportunity for both the businesses and students to connect. And then Chelsea shared about Stock Market Challenge. So I'll pass it back to you. All right, and what you're probably hearing and hopefully hearing a lot of in the community is the Purdue Henson Junior Achievement Center. Um, yes, yay. Uh, we are very excited. Uh, this is the old Kmart off of Route 50 that was selected because uh, we do cover a large area. So Caroline Talbot, Dorchester, Wicomico, Worcester, Somerset, Accomack County, and most likely Northampton, Kent, and Queen Anne's. Um, so large territory, so about 10,000 students annually will come to this facility every single year. And um, there's a lot to learn here. So it's a simulated city. The inside of the facility looks just like a city. We have the local businesses that are sponsoring each of the storefronts. So there's 18 storefronts there. And as you can see, we worked very hard to make sure it doesn't look like Kmart anymore. I hope you can all see that it doesn't look like Kmart anymore. Um, but it's 25,000 square feet of true life simulation. And we're partnering with so many organizations in the community like Salisbury Neighborhood Housing, who's going to utilize the space to not only educate, but allow their um, clients to go through the simulation and practice paying their bills, paying their water bills, signing up for their mortgage and all that fun stuff that we love so much. Um, and then also Lower Shore Enterprises, Dove Point, when their clients need to become more independent, they have the ability to utilize our space to practice that. Um, our goal is that we are open as much as possible. Maybe some of the staff will sleep for just a little bit. Um, but other than that, we want to be open to the community. We want everyone to use it. Um, we're going to be doing poverty simulations um, and things like that. So we're very, very excited, uh, hoping Hoping, hope, ugh, hoping to be done in spring of 23 um, and then open to our students in September of 23. So welcome to ask any questions that you might have. I would welcome all of you for a tour if you have not done so yet. Um, every tour we give, people are like, oh, we did not realize the magnitude. It is extremely 
amazing. So um, when they're in that auditorium and they find out they're 42 years old and they make $38,000 a year and they have two kids, and we're like, see you in four and a half hours. And they have to buy a house, buy a car, get insurance, all those things. SGA people, that's good, good practice, right? Right? Um, so anyway, thank you all for your support. We can't do this, obviously, without the support of our school system. So we appreciate you very much and welcome to answer any questions that you might have. Well, I don't have any questions, but I will say I thoroughly enjoyed my time of uh, volunteering with you at the Inspire. Um, my sister, Tracy Jones, actually connected me with you ladies. Um, so now that I'm going to have a little bit of free time on my hands, I would absolutely watch love it. Watch <laughs> it. <laughs> I would love to uh, continue volunteering and being more involved. Um, when you brought this concept to us and showed us what the storefronts would look like and all of the people you had backing it and the sponsors and what you were doing for the, the students, it absolutely floored many of us. Um, my daughter is actually going, is in the seventh grade, so she will get to work on some things with you ladies, which is exciting. Seventh grade this year? Yes. Okay, so yes. Yes, and um, you know, I, I would absolutely love to, to be involved and, and help you guys out with this. I think it's a very wonderful thing that we're doing for the community and it's not just for the students in Wicomico County Public Schools you're reaching out to many many um, other individuals and other groups um, and I think that that's what's going to make this so valuable so thank you very much for all your hard work thank you very much I also was um, doing a bad job with the clicker but that's what the city looks like <laughs> so when the doors open and the students are pushed out into the reality and they're upset about the two kids and not being able to afford the navigator that's where they'll live. <laughs> and uh, and uh, our local businesses are the ones supporting and this entire experience. So each one of those sponsorships makes us a fully functioning facility the day we open. So big thank you to them as well. Um, I also have no questions, but I just want to say this sounds so cool. Like as a student <laughs> listening to it, I was like, wow. Um, I hear a lot of students talk about how they learn nothing in high school besides A squared plus B squared equals C squared or Y, y equals MX plus B. And they're like, <laughs> how do I pay my bills? Um, um, I use that every day. <laughs> do you? No. Uh, yeah, no. that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so congratulations. That sounds so cool. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And now you know why I wanted them to come speak with us today. They're doing great things over there, and it's a pleasure to partner with them and, and Junior Achievement Organization. So I will um, next go over to Dr. Briggs, and he is going to provide us with our monthly blueprint update. So now we shift to the chief academic officer at A squared plus B squared. <laughs> and I, I think after that, he and his team are going to take us through some student performance data and reading and math. So turn it over to him. Thank you, Dr. Stolfer. I think I'm on. And A squared plus B squared equals C squared is critically important. <laughs> <laughs> I, can that later. I can't wait to find out when I'll use that. I will. I will. So <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk after. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you. I'll send you my presentation, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you again, Dr. Stauffer, um, for the opportunity to share a little bit about Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Many of you were here in previous meetings, but as I thank Dr. Stauffer every day for the opportunity to serve as our Blueprint Coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to publicly thank him as much as possible. So I'll do that again tonight. Most of what I have to share tonight will be a review for um, those of you who were here last month, but I know there's some new guests as, as well, so I will take my time a little bit to go through that, um, share just a little bit of new information, and then talk about the timeline. So first, just a reminder, especially for those new to us tonight, about the five key policy areas that are under the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. These are the five key aspects that the AIB is working with directly with the MSDE and local education's um, local districts to support. So early childhood education, high quality, diverse teachers and leaders, college and career readiness, more resources to ensure that all students are successful and government and accountability. 
We talked a little bit about timeline last week, and that's going to be the mo most of my discussion tonight. And we are in the public comment period um, right now, anticipating the AIB formally adopting the comprehensive plan on December 1st. This is a, a date that many of us have been anxiously awaiting. Um, local superintendents and various other blueprint coordinators, um, local uh, teacher association, community people, community staff are providing input to the AIB right now. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So the draft comprehensive plan, which I have a copy, 160 pages for anybody who would like to have some light reading tonight. Um, it's also available on the AIB's website. It was published on October 26th. It was about two weeks later than what they were supposed to publish it. Um, but it was published. It's not complete. It's very much in draft form. They are soliciting feedback, um, again, with that December 1st uh, adoption date looming in the future. Most importantly for us is the initial implementation plan for local school districts. This plan is basically guiding what we have to submit to the MSD, to MSDE and the AIB for approval. It was finally published on November 4th. As I said earlier, we're currently reviewing that with our various steering committees and our pillar work groups, and we will be submitting um, written feedback to the AIB, um, thanking them for many of the things that they're doing, and also suggesting some opportunities for improvement. And let me actually go back one second here. It says that public comments are open till December 1st. Just uh, to share, and this isn't on the slide, the AIB is really submitting public comments for anybody who's interested, or they're accepting public comments up until November 23rd. So anybody here tonight or anybody listening at home, um, anybody who wants to provide feedback really needs to get that to the AIB by November 23rd so that they can be responsive to that um, by that December 1st deadline. So that's it as far as um, drafts and implementation plans. I do want to update everybody on one key change based upon the law um, as, that came a part of the blueprint and specifically to our CCR um, pillar, and that is the dual enrollment. Um, you heard many uh, talk tonight about the dual enrollment opportunities that we've expanded throughout the years. You heard those in many of the proclamations. So based upon the change in code, which to be full disclosure, we were not aware of, we, we missed it. Every district in the state missed it. <laughs> um, but the responsibility for, for paying for dual enrollment is now on the LEAs. Previously, free and reduced meal students had a m discounted rate and others also um, had a reduced rate, not quite to the same extent, but the parents had to fit the bill for that. Now it falls on us. We're very thankful of the positive relationship that we have with both SU and Warwick. Um, they've been great to work with through um, this past semester. Um, all of our students and families who were impacted by this have been uh, communicated with. As you can expect, it went over very well because <laughs> they didn't have to pay. Um, <laughs> But working with our, uh, our fiscal team, we were able to reallocate some resources and it's approximately about a $250,000 hit on our operating budget this year. And we anticipate that will increase in the future. And we're, as we begin the budget process uh, for FY24, that's gonna play a key role as are uh, many other aspects of the blueprint. So I stand for any questions you might have about blueprint before I introduce our next team to share some information as well. I'm pretty confident that in the December board meeting, we'll have a lot more information and I can dive a little bit deeper into the final plan that gets submitted. Okay. Call you? I'll call you, yes. We'll have a, a breakfast or lunch meeting on that. <laughs> All right, so if my team, or members of our team can come down. Over the past few weeks, there have been several news articles highlighting the decline in the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, across the nation as well as here in Maryland. And as we mentioned in previous settings, coming out of COVID, we too saw declines in student achievement, similar to other districts across the state and country. But our instructional team has been working hard to meet each student where they are and advance their learning to the greatest extent possible. To assist our schools and teachers in helping each student every day, 
we give diagnostic assessments each fall, and I've asked members of our team to share district level data specific to both math and reading, as well as instructional modifications that we've made. I'd like to thank in advance Ms. Julie Dill, Ms. Karen Hitch, Mr. Andrew Todd, Ms. Re Dr. Renee Hall, Ms. Lisa King, Ms. Lisa McKinnon, and Thomas Freddy for sharing some information with you this evening. And we look forward to having more frequent data sharing opportunities at future meetings. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you and good evening. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight regarding our first round of local assessment data. Um, the first thing that I want to share with you is that every Absolutely. Um, the first thing that I want to share with you is that every fall we are giving diagnostic data from our students. We're doing the ELA and the math. Um, we're going to focus in tonight on our ELA first. Um, our students take the iReady reading assessment in grades 1 through 12 each year, and we take that baseline data to make instructional decisions that our su content supervisors will speak about tonight. The iReady assessment is an online assessment that our students are taking on their student-issued devices. Um, the particular test that they take is adaptive, and the students are not timed so that they're able to work through the assessment. And if a student requires accommodations based on their EL plan, their IEP, or their 504 plan, they actually can receive those accommodations inside of the platform. Our students in grades 1 through 8 actually take the assessment three times over the course of the school year, the first occurring this fall. They'll take it again in January, and they'll take it in May. Our kindergarten students take it two times over the course of the year. They're going to be taking it in January, and they're going to be taking it in May. We did not include them in the fall because of the fact that they are completing the kindergarten readiness assessment as a state requirement. Then we also give the assessment two times per semester for our grade 9 through 12 students. The reported data tonight reflects all of our grade 1 through 8 students and any grade 9 through 12 student that's currently enrolled in a semester 1 English class. When you're looking at the grade span data on the next slide, I do caution you when you look at 9 through 12 because we do not include our AP English or our dual enrollment students in that. They are not required to take the diagnostic assessment. We are happy to report that this year we have a 2.5% increase in the students demonstrating readiness for grade level instruction from the fall of 2021 to the fall of 2022 and that our farms population actually increased 3.6% from the fall of 21 to the fall of 22. You will see a decline slightly in our EL population, but it's important to note that that group has actually increased to over 1,500 students. That's a 17% increase from the fall of last year when our EL students took the assessment. And as you can see there, individual reports did go home to all of our families immediately following the diagnostic for ELA. Oops. We're going to take a deeper dive into the ELA data. Um, I'm happy to report that 60.7% of our students in grades 1 through 5 taking the fall diagnostic demonstrated that grade level, that they were ready for that grade level instruction. The combined percentage of students ready for grade level instructions in 1 through 5 actually increased 4.1% for all students. And when we look at grades 1 through 12 combined, we see an increase of 2.5% for all students from the fall of last year to the fall of this year. We actually had seven grade levels that showed an increase in performance from the fall of 21 to the fall of 22. And the percentage of grade two students demonstrating readiness for grade level instruction increased by 11.5%. That was the highest percentage increase that we have seen since la or from last year. And our grade one, they had the highest percentage of students ready for grade level instruction at 85.9%. And I think that's a tribute to the instruction that's occurring in our kindergarten program across the system. Dr. Hall's now gonna share with you some additional information regarding how we're responding to that data, K-5 to and ELA. Good evening. Um, so to piggyback off of all of our early childhood initiatives, we're really excited in our K-5 to curriculum and ELA. We have developed a literacy vision and ELA framework <laughs> that is aligned to the science of reading. That uh, vision is actually Y3 through 12, so we're very excited about that. Um, <clears throat> teachers in K-5 to are implementing foundational skills programs aligned to the science of reading. In particular, Hegarty is being implemented from Y3 to second grade, and the 95% core phonics is implemented from kindergarten through third grade. Our Tier 2 and 3 interventions are aligned to the diagnostic data based on the student needs. And we utilize 95% intervention programs, so that way um, there is um, a consistent uh, message and consistent routines and language that is being shared across interventions as well as the classroom. 
This year we realigned a position and we now have a science of reading coach that has been established to build teacher and administrator knowledge around the science of reading. Uh, we have 95% consultants, that's the program, not 95% of our consultants, but 95% consultants are visiting all of our elementary schools twice this year. The visits are focused on the implementation feedback of the program as well as individualized professional development for our teachers. The uh, literacy coaches are having data discussions that are, um, and with reading specialists as well during PLCs in which we analyze all of our data that we have and determine instructional responses based on that. And now I will at least share about six to 12. So exciting. Thank you, Renee. Good evening, everyone. So I'm pleased to uh, share the following uh, key things that we're doing in secondary. As you can see, I got a little excited with all of my bullets, um, but <laughs> I'm pleased to share that we have started implementing an 80, 90 minute instructional framework for our secondary teachers to follow that incorporates many best practices to meet the needs of our diverse students. Uh, our students are taking the iReady um, My Path lessons, which is a part of our iReady assessment for reading. That is tailored towards their instructional needs. Teachers are able to adapt those lessons um, as they see the student's pass rate. So we're pleased that teachers are looking at that data and making those adjustments as needed. In high school this year, we are um, looking at implementing iReady My Path lessons with our students who are performing three grade levels or below. So that is something new this year that we're trying to support those students who are um, below um, grade level. We're holding data chats because we want to make sure our students are owning their data and understand what the data means. So before our county assessments, we're holding data chats before and after the assessment so students can make those goals and see how they have done on the assessments. Uh, in middle school this year, uh, through some collaboration, I'm pleased to share that our EL students who score a proficiency level of 3.5 or lower will be participating in Imagine Learning, and that's a platform that's geared towards our ELL students, and they'll do that instead of My Path lessons. Uh, in sixth grade, uh, students who require intervention um, because of them being in the levels of one to two grade levels below, um, they are either participating in different uh, intervention programs that are, toward, that are catered towards their needs. We also have a new uh, digital platform that we're using in secondary called StudySync, and that's being used for our texts that our students will be reading. And what's really um, nice about this is our teachers can set proficiency levels for all of their students, um, whether it's advanced, approaching, or extending for them. Scaffolds can be set as well so that students can have access to the, to the text. Professional development is being provided for our teachers uh, through, L through PLC meetings and also county professional development meetings. And you can see the <coughs> three bullets there of the things that we've covered thus far. And then lastly, I'm pleased to um, share that we are holding data chats with our administrators after uh, our uh, county assessments so that they are well aware of what the data says and how we're addressing that, that data. Hi, I'm Tom Ferretti, data analyst. Um, here to discuss the MAP exam, which is our math online exam. Uh, we give it to grades K through 12, but uh, similar to the ELA exam, we didn't give it to uh, grade K, kindergarten, for the fall. They're taking it twice later in the year, so the, gr the data you're gonna see is grades one through 12. Same testing windows as the ELA exam as well. Um, this test is also adaptive and uh, is not timed. Uh, we give five tiers that a student can score, and we're measuring the percentage of students who scored average or above on the fall map for this year versus the last year. Um, in the special services, we see that we've been pretty steady and consistent from where we were last year, not much change. The biggest change is that our farms population increased by a little less than 2%, um, and the SPED in the ELL population is pretty similar, as well as all students. For the grade level distribution, elementary is really where we're making the most gains from last year. We're up 4.7% in students that scored average and above. Our highest, 
Our highest increase is actually in grade three, where we increased by 7.4%, and grade one has our actual highest achievement, scoring 58.2% of students at average or above. Julie Dill, I'm acting as elementary supervisor tonight to just share some of the things that we've put in place um, in our elementary programs. So we started something last year called Win Time. Um, it stands for What I Need, and this is part of daily small group instruction, so it's an additional 20 to 30 minutes that has been added to the math block um, so that teachers can target those specific needs that small groups of students need. And of course, we're using the map assessment data in order to identify what those needs are. Uh, previous year, oh, last year in recovering from COVID, we actually incorporated two flex days. And we did not actually teach all of this content standards in our elementary math classrooms. We decided across the state to really focus on the most essential math standards. So for us, we're pretty proud of, of that 4.7% gain, knowing that many of the standards we did not teach but the students still receive those questions on the map assessment, so we still showed um, growth, even though many of those um, content standards we did not address in our instruction. We are addressing all the content standards, however, this year, we're, and we're doing that, again, across the state. So we also use an adaptive um, learning platform called Dreambox Learning, and we're able to use the map assessment scores to assign specific targeted lessons based on the student performance in the map assessment. So they get differentiated um, lessons based on their needs and their strengths and their weaknesses. So we're pushing that, that accelerated learning at the same time we're also addressing those deficits. We continue to focus on small group instruction during that win time to also offer a math intervention with a program called Do the Math. We piloted that last year. We saw some great gains for the teachers that used it. So it is now being implemented across the county in grades one through five. And again, we use that map assessment score to target the, the students that are specifically um, benefiting from that program. We also have in our grade four to five classrooms, three times a week we have air tutors. Um, many of you will probably recall on the board last year that we brought that to your attention. We received a over $4 million tutoring grant last year as a way to um, bridge that gap with recovery. So we've been using that tutoring grant in math by um, working with a company called Air Tutors and they're virtual tutors that work with the students three times a week. There are four students maximum that are assigned to one tutor online and that takes place during the math classroom so our math classroom teachers can monitor um, that, those programs um, within their classroom. We have also developed our online unit assessments in our program eDoctrina that align with the MCAP levels of rigor and the assessments that we use locally mirror what those state assessments will be and that also through our eDoctrina platform provides our students with those necessary accommodations. And then finally, we are using our, our team of coaches. We're fortunate to have math coaches across the district, and we are focusing our professional development this year on EL and SPED strategies. In looking at the scores, we know that many of the strategies we use for those student populations benefit all students, so specifically focusing on math language routines, visual vocabulary cards, and anchor charts we feel will be very beneficial. So I'm going to pass it on to Lisa McKinnon, our secondary math supervisor. Good evening. Uh, this year in grades six through eight, uh, we have scheduled intervention uh, and small group instruction for our middle school students, about 20 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, typically, or three days a week. Um, we put it in place uh, at least those three times, again, based off of the MAP assessment, what are our students need, and to group our students based on their individual needs. Uh, we also, in grades six through eight, a uh, select group of students, again, who are below uh, level, who just need a little bit of extra help and support, is in an intervention program called Math 180. Uh, I, we are privileged in two of our high schools this year to be able to offer a pilot intervention program for students who uh, just need a little bit of extra push from middle school to high school in grade nine for Algebra One. Um, the idea there is that they will be with a math Algebra One teacher first semester. They'll be with the same group of students and they will actually be with the same Algebra One teacher next semester, which is when they'll take the MCAP exam. So we're trying to 
this get those skills that they need um, first semester so that they will be successful second semester uh, with algebra one being a graduation requirement uh, we also are fortunate this year again to have Alex again, which is an individualized adaptable platform um, And we are adding Delta math for all 6 to 12 teachers uh, again It helps facilitate instruction and remediate concepts uh, again that they'll need for higher level math instruction uh, Just like Julie said we are also utilizing air tutors um, For the most part uh, sixth through eighth grade. It's three days a week for 30 minutes and then for our algebra one students during the flex time for 30 minutes uh, Monday Wednesday Friday it's also for those students um, in algebra one who just again may need that extra help and support um, after term one we are very fortunate also to be able to offer students if they so choose after school hours um, they can sign up and um, calculus trig pre-calc any subject area if they would like can sign up to have a uh, air tutor available to them at least one hour a week and then um, just like uh, Julie is doing um, I did come from um, we know we need support for our students in the EL and special ed which all of those same strategies we use for those will also be good for all students and so we also are incorporating um, the mathematics language routines um, in our classrooms And I get to finish things up. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. So as you can see from to this point, um, we've shared data specific to two platforms, both iReady and MAP. And throughout last year and through the beginning of this presentation, all of our data has looked through one lens, which is based on uh, student level, which is relative to the grade level that the student is in. Well, the beauty of these two platforms is there's actually an extra data point that we can look at and we're choosing to look at this year. Uh, which is it takes us away from looking at a specific grade level and instead looks at where the student starts and where the student ends relative to their age and their grade. So it's a little bit different. So the way it works is each student takes an initial assessment in the fall and receives a baseline score. And that score is compared to norm data across the country uh, for students who have that exact same score, who are that exact same age and that exact same grade. And then both iReady and MAP will project an annual growth target of what is expected for that particular student at that particular level, at that particular age, in that particular grade. It's a lot of that particulars, right. <laughs> Well, what's nice about this, though, is it will give us a measure of whether the student, each individual student, is actually learning at the level in which they are supposed to be learning. So grade level instruction, understanding whether the student is above or below grade level, we're still going to continue to look at. We're going to still plan intervention groups and all those things around it. But at the same time, we also want to look at the end of the day, did each student learn at the rate that they were supposed to learn at, considering where they're starting? So imagine the most challenging student and the student that is setting the world on fire. Each one of them has their own path, has their own target, and both MAP and the iReady assessment measures that. So our goal this year as a system is we asked all schools and all special populations in all grades to set a minimum bar of 60% of all students to hit their annual growth target for the students in their building. So that's every grade, every school, every subgroup. Um, we also asked schools to look at their data from last year, because we actually had this data that we pulled over the summer from last year, and to also plan in their ILT plan, set a goal of at least 10% increase on top of the minimum threshold of 60%. So looking at our data from last year, uh, this is what we were sitting at as of this past summer. So as you can see, is in terms of iReady, uh, we had 48.92% of our students who actually met their annual growth target in iReady. Um, and in MAP, we had 56.09% of our students that met their annual growth target in, uh, on the MAP test. So as you can see, the data is different, but it's supposed to be different. It's measuring something completely different. We also broke this down in FARM, SPED, and e ELL. Um, the goals, um, as you can see, show a 10% increase, although, like I said, we did require all schools to make a minimum of 60% as the baseline there for both the math and the reading 
uh, for their schools. So all those are built into their ILT plans. So again, it's not replacing any data points. All of the data is extremely important. It's still important to look at you know, how close we are to grade level, where these students are, above grade level, below grade level. But at the same time, I also think it's important to see whether or not these students are actually learning at the rate in which they're supposed to be learning. Dr. Stahl, I think I'm on. Dr. Stahl, just in closing, I want to thank everybody, the supervisors and uh, Director Jill, or <laughs> Julie Dill for presenting tonight. But more importantly, the presentation tonight was, I, th I hope, informative. More importantly is the support that they provide the schools each and every day down to the classroom level. And what was shared tonight is district-wide to give you a snapshot. But that same conversation is held with every single principal and admin team about their specific school's data. And then the, each school then has the conversation with the students. We're not just assessing kids just to assess kids. We're getting meaningful information to then drive our instruction to help each one of those kids. And so just want to thank our entire team who presented tonight, again, for <laughs> presenting, but more importantly, for what they're yeah. doing each day. Dr. Briggs, I'd like to say something. Um, I was quite interested in what you were saying. I was involved in de <coughs> helping design the first statewide testing in the state of Delaware. And that I did the reading testing for our district for about 25 years. So I was very interested in your statistics and how you <laughs> presented your program. Thank you for all you do because been there, done that. I would also say, and I'm going to share your question. If okay, it's okay yeah, we were, we were battling um, back and forth there. I would just, I would just say that he, he asked, essentially, is there another district that is exactly like ours that take exactly the same tests and the same grade levels that maybe we could compare ourselves to from beginning to end and how we do? And I said, no, probably not. However, then, Andrew, you started talking about, and that's when I hit him, uh, uh, talking about. That was the second time he hit me, third time. <laughs> you can share in that, Dr. Hanlon. Um, so what I talked about when you started talking about the individual students and how you can compare individual growth, where they start, where they end, and a student to students that are across different areas, different counties, different states. Because I'm sure you read the same thing and hear the same thing we hear all the time. It's a test scores are this or that and trying to compare it to a national test, trying to compare it to other counties. So that's why I was asking them all those questions. But the, what you guys presented was so informative. I don't think anybody would disagree. That was tremendous. So thank you very much. And question, Mr. Palmer, sorry. Just one quick question. It was a good uh, presentation. Uh, I've seen presentations uh, similar to this many times over the past 20 years. And my question is, at what point will you be able to determine whether this new program is having an actual effect on the students' grades? And I mean, don't let it slip down the line for another five years before we say, well, this program hasn't worked quite as well as we expected. So how long is it going to be until you get some facts in to determine whether or not your program is working? And will you be able to make the changes yourself, or is that going to have to go through the state in Maryland? I'll, I'll give it a shot, Mr. Palmer. So first of all, if – in the presentation that each of the supervisors shared, there was not a single one program that was shared. It was a wide variety of resources and tools to help the students. So there, I don't think there's gonna be a time where we're gonna be able to say, yep, we've made it, we've, this one's it, every kid should use this program. There, is, there isn't one program. Um, I think all of those tools that were shared with you tonight are good resources to help us meet our, each student's needs moving forward. We're going to continue to look at our data, as we always do, to see if indeed a change in one resource for maybe a certain student population or a certain grade level is um, meeting the needs. We also collaborate with our counterparts across the county, across the state and nation who are using similar products and seeing what the research is. Um, so we're, not, we're never going to be satisfied like this is it. Um, we're going to continue to look at what we're using, see what else is out there um, to see if it will help us meet the needs of our kids. When you see that they're not meeting those standards that you're uh, 
that you're expecting, then will you have the authority to change it yourself? All of those resources it? that were shared tonight were internal local decisions. Yes. Outstanding. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question. It's kind of similar but different. Um, I know we lost a lot due to COVID, but how do you guys feel about the progress that is being made or lack of progress uh, based upon trying to catch up or regain the losses that, w that were incurred <laughs> during that time? I'll speak openly. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> From the assessment and accountability side, I would say the data discussions that are happening in our system right now are richer and deeper than they've been in quite some time. So everyone is reflecting on that data. So that's very powerful um, from the classroom level and their comfort level with reading the data that's coming from these platforms all the way up to the administrators being able to speak um, fluidly about their data. elementary when we piloted last year the do the math program we specifically looked at one domain um, with it the report in the map assessment which is the operations and algebraic thinking because that's what the uh, do the math modules targeted and most of those students showed an average growth of about 20 percent um, based on that so that's why we have pushed that program very hard across the district with all grade one through through five I have very few math intervention teachers but we do have that additional flex time every day that win time that all classroom teachers are utilizing that program so we are seeing promising results in, in our recovery efforts um, in ELA, I'm very excited. Uh, once they, we give the iReady assessment, we have a screener that we give to some students that are identified based on the iReady result that really digs down into where students are struggling. And we are seeing great gains of our students learning the skills that they had lost um, in uh, making some amazing efforts. And the classroom teachers are just doing phenomenal with the implementation of a new phonics program. Um, and uh, so very excited about the gains that we're seeing in reading in a very short amount of time that we have not seen before. Mr. Brown, just to follow up a little bit, I think we are happy with some of the small wins that we're, that we're seeing, right? Um, however, we are by no means satisfied with where we are, I think would be, would be my, my bad answer to, the, to your question. You know, um, some of our students are, are meeting su with success, and that's a, a, and we need to celebrate those successes. But we have a very s challenging student population, and it's tough work. And our teachers, and our supervisors, and our administrators are doing all they can to make sure that they meet with success both in and out of the classroom, and including these assessments. So we're going to keep working at it. And I'll just share a funny to help close that. Um, we talked about the data. Um, chats that we're having with our students and the teachers shared that they saw more this year their students taking the initiative to take the assessment seriously mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity to do, go and do walkthroughs from middle school to high school and I happened to be in one middle school classroom and a young man I was sitting beside a young man and he's doing his my path lesson and he said I should have taken my assessment a lot seriously because it's saying that I'm on a first grade level and I'm not. This is easy work. So right then and there, the teacher decided to move his, his MyPath lessons to a place where he could, he felt where he was being challenged. So the students are, they're owning it, they're seeing it, and they're trying to make that change. I gotta thank the entire instructional uh, team that's in front of us. Thank you so much for the time that you put into this. And more importantly, I know this is just an extension of what you're doing every day. So thank you all so much for your, your time tonight. These are important conversations to have. And I think this is important information for our board members to hear and also more importantly, our community to hear. So great job. Thank you all very much. With that, Mr. Paul Butler, we are ready for the Extra Mile Award winners this evening. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Stauffer. <clears throat> we have two Extra Mile Award winners tonight, and we also have a very special award that uh, Dr. Stauffer is going to hand out in just a little bit. Our first Extra Mile Award winner actually is not here tonight. He had to go to a birthday party. But that's okay. We're still going to recognize him. 
Um, anybody who works in Northgate at Central Office, they all know Tony White. Tony White, of course, is an uh, IT support, a support specialist, amazing guy, always walking around saying hello, smiling, good morning, uh, always helpful. Well, t- uh, Tony started the help desk, got promoted to food service support, and, of course, now an IT support specialist, always seems to be around when there's nobody else around to help. So he's just amazing. He steps in all the time. He drops what he's doing and fixes it immediately. He's mannerly, efficient, precise, always, like I said before, has an amazing smile, always says good morning. And because of his willingness to drop whatever he's doing to always help others in our central office building, Tony White is an Extra Mile Award winner for the month of October. So we're going to give Tony a big hand, even though he's not here. But... We do have his supervisor, Ashley Hill, who's going to accept on Tony's behalf. So, Ashley, if you'll come down. We'll have Tracy take your picture along with Mr. Malone and Dr. Stauffer. Thank you, Ashley. Oh, gave you the wrong one. Let me give you the right one. There you go. There you go. Thank you. And by the way, you may have noticed that we don't have the trophies tonight. Um, Our trophy provider, which is Robinson's, uh, closed over the weekend because they're moving into a new building. Um, so they didn't get a chance to make the uh, trophies, but they will have them, they told me, by Wednesday or by Thursday. So we'll have them to them as well. All right, our next Extra Mile Award winner is a gentleman who is here. Um, recently, Choices Academy Assistant Principal Michael Beal uh, reached out to risk management, uh, asking if they would consider allowing a student field trip to go fishing for some Choices students. Well, phys ed teacher... Bobby Bates, come on down, Bobby. Come on down, Courtney. Ask, was asked if he could apply to an actual educational curriculum, okay, a fishing trip. Well, Mr. Bates went above and beyond, providing state and national physical education standards that applied to the trip. He showed how the Outdoors Tomorrow Foundation had purchased necessary materials and resources for teachers that would like to incorporate this unit into their PE classes. Well, Bobby also took it upon himself to communicate with the Department of Natural Resources to receive a fishing license that covers all the students and staff and accompanying adults while participating in this uh, event, ensuring that our staff and students were legally covered to go fishing. Well, in addition, Bobby has been teaching the uh, all-in-class education to students prior to the trip, including he was taking them outside in the Choices yard and teaching them how to cast the rod, (laughs) right? So it was amazing to witness. Now, the staff was engaged. The students seemed to enjoy the trip tremendously, and uh, we are truly hopeful that this was just the beginning for what can uh, can be done here for Wicomico County Public Schools with outdoor education and for going above and beyond for our students at Choices. Uh, We want to recognize Mr. Bobby Bates for deserving the Extra Mile Award for the month of October. And Mr. Bates, there's yours. We're going to have your picture taken. (laughs) Did he get any fish? I asked him if he caught any fish. They were delicious. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. And we'll get your trophy to you on Thursday. All right. And and I want to say one last thing. It's been a pleasure um, working with Mr. Fitzgerald and Mr. Murray and Mrs. Laird Lewis and Mrs. Suthowski uh, doing the Extra Mile Award for you guys every month and just really appreciate your service to Wicomico County Public Schools. So thank you.
Actually, I do. <laughs> Mrs. Phyllis Collins, can you come down front, please? And anyone that came with you, can you bring them with you? <laughs> I saw the look of relief on their face. So. <clears throat> Golden Apple Award. This is a very special award. Mrs. Phyllis Collins is a bus contractor that drives bus number 16 and picks up and drops off a young student in Hebron. On a particular day, she had followed all the procedures, as she should, and pulled off of Route 50 onto the shoulder to allow the student off the bus to their house, which is adjacent to Route 50. The door to the bus had already been open, and the student was getting ready to get off the bus when Mrs. Collins noticed what was happening in her side mirror and quickly put her arm out in front of the exiting student to stop the student from getting off the bus. A vehicle had come barreling off Route 50, off the highway, to the right of the bus on the side where the exit door is. The vehicle went down into a ditch and up and over a driveway, the same driveway where the student would have been stepping off the bus to go to their home. The quick action saved the student from certain injury or worse. And we are so very grateful to you, Mrs. Collins, for being alert of the surroundings and acting so quickly to stop the student from stepping off the bus. The student's parents, family, and the Wicomico County Public School System cannot say thank you enough to Mrs. Phyllis Collins, and we want to honor her with this very special Superintendent's Golden Apple Award. Thank you. Last but not least, we're going to end the superintendent's report with our monthly grant report from Dr. Rager. Good evening, Chairman Malone, Vice Chair Murray, and members of the board. I'm pleased to share updates this evening regarding our ongoing efforts to support our financial position through writing and acquiring grants. In October, we received 25 grants totaling $408,029. 20 of these were from the Community Foundation for a wide variety of projects, including arts integration, reading incentives, and school gardens. Of note, Mardella Middle and High teacher John Wickstead was honored with the Mary Gay Calcott Award of Excellence, which includes a bonus grant of additional funds for his innovative proposal of a traveling children's theater. We received $200,000 from the Maryland Center for School Climate and Safety for initiatives to improve the physical security of our school buildings. The Depart Maryland Department of Environment granted $32,000 for our continuing efforts to monitor drinking water in our schools, and our maintenance department received three grants totaling over $119,000 for playground upgrades. October also saw the submission of 37 grants totaling over $298,000, and I look forward to briefing you on their outcomes at a future meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Egger. I would also like to just say that uh, we have had three community forums so far, and they have been very enjoyable. Uh, I look forward to Thursday. This is our last uh, community forum at these forums, uh, just talking a little bit about our school system, some of the background information, where we are currently some of our uh, thoughts and ideas about blueprint and where we're going to move forward and then mostly just looking to hear from uh, the community what what questions there are and what feedback uh, that we're getting so these have these have been um, forums that have been open to our community members and this last one on Thursday is at six o'clock and will be at Westside uh, Intermediate out in Hebron so thank you very much and with that that concludes our board report. Thank you, Dr. Stauffer. So 4.1, approval of open session minutes from October the 11th. I'll entertain a motion. 
Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. 5.1 through 5.11 are consent items. 5.12, upon the recommendation of the superintendent, is there a motion to approve the consent items? Move, Move to, to approve. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, 6.1, we have two action items this evening. Per the superintendent's recommendation, is there a motion to approve amending the fiscal year 2024 to 2029 capital improvement plan and budget previously approved on September 13th, 2022? as applicable for the top three FY 2024 priority projects and resubmit to the County Executive and the State of Maryland Interagency Commission on Public School Construction. I'll entertain a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mrs. Ashby. Good evening, Dr. Stafford. Chair Malone, Vice Chair Murray, and board members. The FY 2024-2029 Capital Improvement Plan and Budget was approved by the board on September 13th after an in-depth work session on August 30th. WCPS staff have met with local and state government um, staff members to discuss projected revenue and funding. Uh, local government has indicated an anticipated reduction in available bonding capacity due to county debt limits. The Interagency Commission on School Construction staff has indicated a potential increase in funding due to several factors. Therefore, the top three priority projects uh, have been revised accordingly. Priority one, Mardella renovation and addition. For FY 2024, the allocation will be 6,769,000. For FY 2025, it will be $1,472,532. Priority two, Wacomico High's roof replacement for FY 2024 to the county, the allocation will be $950,000. For the state, it will be $5,652,783. For priority three, Fruitland primary replacement, the allocation to the county will be reduced to 1,300,000, asking for consideration for 350,000 in PAYGO. In total, this would get the top four projects within the county's projected potential bonding capacity. If approved, this amendment will be submitted to local and state government. Are there any questions regarding this recommendation? Any questions? As Mrs. Ashby said, we did a lot of this in work sessions, so that's why there's no questions. Although, oh, so it, um, assuming you're ready to vote then on the motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? It's carried. Thank you, Thank Mrs. You Ashby. 6.2, upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, is there a motion to approve the school bus replacement request for fiscal year 24 from school bus contractors? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Hughes, floor is yours. <coughs> Good evening, Chairman Malone, Superintendent Stauffer, other board members, I won't be with you long. Uh, put this, uh, <laughs> I uh, put this item under the under uh, action under instead of uh, consent, uh, given the fact that uh, they, we've we've observed a substantial increase in school bus prices uh, over the last year and a half, about thirty percent increase, uh, which uh, then means our contractors are having to spend more to purchase school buses. Uh, using the formula that that we've historically used for compensation or reimbursement, I should say, uh, for school bus contractors. Uh, the, it would cost us uh, in new funds for FY24 about $30,985 to approve these five school buses uh, that has been requested to be replaced uh, by these contractors. Uh, again, it's under uh, action because, again, FY24, we are still in the process of building that budget uh, but these funds, uh, this action needs to be taken tonight, given the lead time about 12 to 14 months to build, to order and build school buses. So we're already behind the eight ball in having these buses uh, here by the first day of school for uh, FY or for school year, next school year. Wow. So with that, I stand for any questions. 
Are there any electric school buses on your list? <laughs> uh, no, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if that was the case, the price would be much more. <laughs> are any of the buses, I, I know these for independent contractors, but what about your fleet? Are you having to replace any? Uh, we are in the. We are planning to replace uh, probably a couple. Fortunately for us, uh, we we plan that e a year in advance, so we have a budget in FY twenty three okay. for those replacements for those. For, okay. for next school year. So, so these are all contractor that buses is that we're just being proactive about right now. Correct. Because on your spreadsheet, it goes up to twenty seven, twenty eight. That is correct. We allow contractors the opportunity to replace their buses once they reach the end of their 10th year of service life. And it also feeds our fleet for uh, co-curricular and extracurricular uh, transportation. Okay. Now, do these buses that they're using here, they're used for field trips as well as their normal route? or So they're definitely, there's a lot of wear and tear on these for them to need to be replaced over the course of 10 years, years. It, okay. any of the buses that they're listed here will be 10 years will, will have concluded their 10 year 10th year of service life by the end of this school year wow okay well your spreadsheet's wonderful so thank you for that any more questions for mr hughes <clears throat> all right i'll assume you're ready to vote on the motion all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed carried Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Thank you. 7.1, public comments. Yes. The public comment section of the agenda is an opportunity for the superintendent and board to listen to individuals' own comments on topics concerning Wicomico County Public Schools. The board chairman has the right to limit public comments in length or those concerning personnel or student matters, which clearly identify an individual or individuals, appeals or legal matters that are before the board, negotiations and topics that are more appropriately addressed in closed session or privately with a staff member. Only verbal comments are permitted during public comment se session of a board meeting. Written, printed audio or video material may be submitted via comments at wcboe.org. No signs or posters may be displayed by the public during board meetings. Each speaker shall address all comments directly to the board and speak only from the designated location for public comments. Tonight we have six individuals who've signed up to speak. So we'll begin with Dr. Perez. Her topic is children's backpacks, weight limitation. And as typical, we have three minute public comment. Is this working? I, yep. Bob, yeah, Mr. Lang has got it turned on. Okay, well, thank you. My name is Alicia Perez. I'm a pediatrician and I am currently working at Chesapeake Healthcare. It used to be called TLC. And I want to bring um, your attention to an increasing concern I have concerning the health hazards of backpacks. Uh, it is not a new problem. It is, it is, it is every day, it is a common, and it's universal. Um, the, the professionals, healthcare providers, and healthcare institutes all know about the problem. They have researched it, they have published. The Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Orthopedics, the American Academy of physical therapist, John Hopkins, Harvard, <laughs> Nemers, Mayo Clinic, University of, every university has guidelines. The National Safety Council have guidelines. The problem is known by the caretakers of children. Um, the problems are usually back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, sometimes falls and injuries. The problems and the health hazards are significant. The national Serv uh, National Health uh, Service Council estimated between 2017 and 2019 there were 7,000 emergency room visits for injuries related to backpacks and 14,000 visits related to, back to, to, to health problems from backpacks. Um, the problem is ours. The problem of healthcare providers and community and consumers is to, f is to, is to find a cure, not prevention. And this problem could be prevented by guidelines that have been published and known. Um, prevention with the weight of the backpacks and the, the use of the backpacks, as well as the construction and the size. Children come in different sizes. Backpacks come in different sizes too. Today I saw a little, a little maybe a kindergarten uh, student carrying a backpack that was under her butt. Um, the problem is serious. It's just not pain. The problem can extend to chronic back pain. 
um, which I'm sure a lot, a lot of us have. The problem has been also described with hikers, with um, firemen, with um, military personnel. But in a child who is growing, the problem becomes more serious because of their growth and their spine. It, it doesn't, it, the problems usually result in- 30 seconds. Okay, um, in nerve issues that could cause brachial plexus, and if there's any weakness, that's a concern. I think that there's legislation necessary, but with legislation, we need implementation and we need a monitoring, and that's where the educators come in. So I'm just asking uh, to, to consider having adopting guidelines from the National Council. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank for you. your service and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our second speaker, uh, Luke Angelet. Topics is new board. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate everyone um, who won the election. Um, I know running for office is a tough task, um, so so congratulations to everyone, um, especially um, the new, um, the four new members. Um, I'd like to um, congratulate them as well. And um, for the four that will not be returning, thank you so much for your service. Um, the past four years have probably been the toughest of everyone's lives, so thank you for your service. Um, I really appreciate the collective efforts that you all put into this school system. Um, but this is uh, this public comment is more for the student representatives rather than the board. But I just want to say that since I will not be able to amplify students' concerns, um, I urge you all to do so. Um, when you're giving your board updates, um, don't just say how the football game or the basketball game or I don't know what season is right now, but how that is going. But also mention how your how things are going, how it feels as a student as of right now. Um, I remember the first. Um, I think it was a couple board meetings ago from back now, but like the first one that you guys were at um, this year, um, I gave a public comment, basically taking back my former public comment about block scheduling. And um, one of you, um, I'm probably paraphrasing now, but you basically said that it sounds good on paper, but it's horrible in reality. So I urge you to keep that, um, basically keep the energy. And um, wh when you're t t talking to the board, let them know how you feel about certain things that are happening right now, because it is, it's, it's, I mean, no disrespect by this, but there are many uh, board members who don't have children or grandchildren in the public school system. So the best way for them to know what's going on is by somebody telling them. So I urge you to do so. And that's all I have to say. I just like to congratulate everyone and thank everyone. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Gary Hammer of Topic Retirees Healthcare Plans. Welcome. Thank you again, good evening. Um, I'm Gary Hammer, I was a band director in the county for 39 years, been retired six, and just turned 68 yesterday. I'm here tonight to express my great disappointment that the Wacomico County Board of Education has decided to save money on the backs of its most vulnerable retirees, those 65 and over. The very retirees that need good insurance the most. By offering them a so-called choice between a dollar store Medicare disadvantage plan or opting out altogether. Either option selected saves the board money, or our TRE's personal costs go up, or their coverage goes down. These are your former employees who went through decades foregoing salary increases on the promise of good health care benefits during their careers and their retirement. There is no honor nor integrity in offering plus 65 retirees this choice. This is another example of broken promises to those who spent most of their lives in your service teaching children not only their subject matter, but in many, ca many cases the very values of honor, honesty, integrity, and the importance of keeping commitments. And now, with the largest budget the Wacomico County Board of Ed has ever had, 65 plus retirees were hand culled out for a switch in insurance coverage. To make matters worse, the sheer lack of transparency in this whole process has been atrocious. From the beginning, this change in health care coverage has been sold as no big deal, no big change from what retirees currently have. Nothing could be farther from the truth. 
They're total opposites, going from pay up front to a more pay as you go type of coverage. The same type of plan is the, is the type of plan that New York City and Delaware State retired policemen, firemen, educators, and state employees are protesting and filing lawsuits against. It's the same type of program that is currently under congressional investigation and review. On a Zoom call that included the head of retiree first, when I asked her if she'd put her own mother on this program, she said she would keep her, her mother on original Medicare with a C&D supplemental program for as long as she could until she absolutely had to put her on an Advantage program. That should give you some insight on this type of program. I know insurance is a complicated subject and we rely seconds. on others, but you have to understand most retirees at this point do not understand they have to give up their original Medicare to enroll for this private nonprofit or for-profit insurance plan. They do not understand that they, if they request to go back on original Medicare at the end of the first trial year, it's difficult to return, and in many cases, it'll be subject to underwriting. For these reasons, I'm requesting that you pause implementation of Care First Advantage Plan for one year for further review by you and us, and I request that you send out all, to all 65 and plus retirees a complete breakdown of differences from the current program compared to the new plan immediately through email and U.S. mail before the December 7th deadline for open enrollment. Time. You need to know the truth. Otherwise, you will forever change the lives of your oldest and most dedicated former employees. You have my contact information. Feel free to contact me. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Gary Beecham, proposed Care First Medicare Advantage program for retirees of the Wicomico Board of Education is the topic. Welcome. Good, well, welcome. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman Malone, Superintendent Dr. Uh, Stoffer, members of the Board of Education, administrators that are still around, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> other interested attendees. Uh, I'm here also to express my concerns about the new Care First Medicare Advantage insurance program for the retirees of Wicomico County Public Schools. Very much I am, am concerned about this. It, it, educators have worked in this county, and I myself worked for 44 years, not only in this county, but in the state of Virginia and the state of Maryland and the state of New York. And we work for the sole purpose of teaching young people and being advocates for young people in our communities. And we accepted lower pay for the promise of a decent retirement and good health insurance. That is not as is presented here as we've had presented to us. Mr. Hammer uh, sort of stole almost, almost all of my uh, uh, words, okay. But I do believe that there, I don't believe that you, the Board of Education, were fully informed about the true impact of this program. I really don't. You're mainly made aware of the amount of money that this program would save you. And I know 90% of the retirees have no idea about the, uh, about the impacts of this program, number one. The retirees will no longer be enrolled in Medicare, period. They are removed from Medicare. This new program is only a government-subsidized, privately-owned company. Think about that. Privately-owned companies, do they have our interest in, in, in their best interests? The federal government has opened an investigation of Medicare, and so has Delaware and New York City. Uh, has put a stay upon their use of that. There are significantly more confusing red tape and approvals needed. And I've called many times and talked to many people. And I appreciate the uh, retiree first that is offered by the board, but I too know that that will most likely go in the future because of budget cuts. I was a supervisor of music and art, so I know. When we are provided, when I asked to provide a complete comparison of the two programs, we are instructed to provide specific examples that we have a question about. The services cannot be anticipated by myself or any other retiree. Thirty seconds. The request has been made also to have a complete uh, comparison of services needed. I implore you not to potentially deny this service and bankrupt literally bankrupt those individuals who do not have the capacity at their elder ages 
mentally or physically to withstand the neglect of this new program. Please allow the year, offer them the ability to sign up for the old program or do away with the program. Those are the choices. We are being forced into this program. We have no choice. We have to go. Thank you. Ms. Jones Smith, topic is grant availability for safe schools. The safer community pact that lawmakers, including U.S. Senators Ben Cardin, Chris Van Hollen, Congressman Benny Hoyer, John Sarbanes, Kwasi Magume, Anthony Brown, and others passed in Washington this October provides almost $17 million in federal funding to foster safe, more supportive learning environments in our schools. As a result, funding from the Stronger Connections Grant Program provides Maryland schools the means to address the social, emotional, physical, and mental health needs of students to reduce the threat of violence in our schools. Legislators recognize the challenges and potential threats to a safe learning environment negatively affect all students' ability to learn. It's time for Wicomico County Public Schools to take advantage of this funding and to take action to make our schools safe, more inclusive learning environments for our students. More than six years ago, WCEA brought to that Board of Education numerous examples of behavior from misconduct to violence in our schools. WCPS held meetings about the issues throughout the rest of that school year and through the summer. WCEA offered suggestions, such as the implementation of restorative practices. We were given PowerPoint presentations and rhetoric. The advice from educators and some Board of Education members to make schools safer was ignored. That was then, this is now. Today, students from pre-K to 12 are causing injuries requiring hospitalization for one another, teachers, and support staff. Learning is frequently disrupted by students' repeated misconduct. Within the last two weeks, two teachers were diagnosed with concussions. Today, we know that research supports community schools, restorative practices, and trauma-informed practices as essential for a safe, productive learning environment. It's even in the blueprint. The social, emotional, physical, and mental health needs of students must be addressed. Our students' opportunities for learning success in our schools is essential seconds. for their future and the future of our community. To be clear, the impact of restorative and trauma-informed practices requires consistency and time. Imagine where we could be if we had begun restorative practices six years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Mr. Edward Lee. Topic is financial literacy. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, <laughs> Dr. Stouffer, uh, Dr. Hanlon, um, I want to speak from a community perspective and carry on the accolades and the recognition of the outgoing board members. I, I, I respect very, very much your service from a community perspective. What you do and what you have done uh, is a service to this community. It's not an easy job setting where you sit. And I know that all of us have not agreed all the time. But I, I, I just think that for our young people, for our students, to be able to put, see this type of interaction with differences being resolved in a cordial, somewhat cordial, sometimes a little contentious, <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, with dignity, with dignity and respect. 
And so I, I, I know that I've talked to, on the subject of financial literacy, uh, to several of you there. Well, I'm going to still be talking to you because we're not finished uh, <laughs> that, that episode uh, yet. And, and those who are still here um, know that I interact directly with people on this subject matter in our community who have strong opinions about it. But I don't, have, I don't think I've ever heard anyone denigrate any member of this board. And, 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 and I, I say that with, with, uh, with somewhat um, pride because many times people in, in situations that we find ourselves sometimes take sides and then you guys have done a great job. I've seen you stand a lot of different kinds of challenges over the last particular year, two years. And, 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 and you, you're, just, you're, you're just great guys. You know, I, I, I was going to come to say some things, but you know, I just, I just sat here and listened to all of this. And this last report, in closing, one of the things that I have gained is the highest respect for our educational system here in, in, in Wacomico and Worcester. I'm going to tell you, you guys do a great job. And I go back to Dr. Andy, he's just left doing a, 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 a proposal working with them uh, on financial literacy, which I'm going to share with you. Uh, I, I'm, it's, it's just great. So let's go forward and get the job done. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So that concludes uh, our public comments portion of the meeting. So 8.1, board members' reports. So if it's okay, I'll start to my left with Miss Ann. The November 2018 election was a historic one for Wicomico County residents because for the first time, county citizens could vote for their school board members. Prior to 2018, school board members were politically appointed. Having spent 16 years on the Republican Central Committee, I know only too well how political and controversial those appointments are or were. After the 2018 election, I became the first woman ever elected to the Wicomico County Board of Education, a distinction no one can ever take away from me. When I first came on the board, Chairman Malone and Vice Chairman Mary, along with Dr. Hanlon, welcomed me. We worked well together along with Dr. Stolfer, Dr. Briggs, Mrs. Miles, Nikki Vesta, and later Andrea have guided me and tried their best to keep me on a straight and narrow path. It's hard work. To the new board, try to work together and put your individual agendas away. This is not what the BOE is about. When you have your MABE training sessions, some of you are going to be surprised at what you cannot do as a BOE member. Actually, I personally feel that this full day training session should be held when you file for office. Then some of you would have not had made the promises you did to your, to your friends and colleagues also, being a BOE member is being out in the public, talking to teachers, parents, students, and community members. It's not sitting at your computer and using Zoom for your meetings. Last year alone, I attended over 113 meetings and events in person. Being a BOE member takes time and commitment. I wish Dr. Stauffer, Dr. Briggs, Dr. Ragor, Mrs. Miles, and Andrea the best for the coming four years 
and I hope the new board works as well with you as we did. Thank you. Mr. Brown? Um, this past Saturday out at the mall, there was a showcase of uh, programs that the school system has. Uh, they had the VPA program there, the STEMS program, uh, career and technology program. Um, it was interesting to see the kinds of things that are going on that the many parents and shoppers in the mall really enjoyed uh, seeing what was going on there. Uh, we had a couple, I think there were three groups that performed on the stage there at Boscow's, uh, the Wacomica Middle School drum line, and boy, was it loud. <laughs> 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 uh, the Mardella Middle and High School Orchestra <coughs> and the uh, Bennett Middle Chorus. It just goes to show that not only are we educating our kids through the knowledge of gaining knowledge, but also helping them involved in the arts. And that's another big part of the educational process. And it was, I think, thoroughly enjoyed by all. Um, I listen at uh, the students, and they always, the really thing that I look forward to here each, each month. But I was really pleased to hear that uh, for the fall sports, they had a great deal of success. I think for the first time, and maybe the second time, all of our football teams actually got to go to the playoffs. Uh, and I like the way they have that structured now, that each one of them, they do get to play some teams outside of uh, our hometown area, which is really <coughs> good. Although they came up a little short, but I'm sure it was a <laughs> rewarding and enjoyable experience for all of them. The other thing is I noticed that uh, uh, I saw a YouTube that was sent to all of us, and we had one of our students uh, a group of students from Parkside High School who played for the um, the, the organization that um, Dr. Palvet belongs to, the Human Resource Organization. They had a, a um, awards program in Ocean City, and our students were selected to perform at that program. And I'm sure that uh, Vince had a great deal to do with that. Yes, you were one. You you were <laughs> great, fantastic, <laughs> super. Yeah, you know, that, that was really good. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, another thing I saw, uh, another uh, correspondence that was sent to us, we have a young lady who is a, uh, t attending Ohio State University, mm -hmm. and she is working in the field of astronomy, and she's come up with some f uh, formulas that we have not s quite seen yet, having to deal with uh, planets, and she's really doing an outstanding job. And that just goes to show you the caliber of students that our school system's turning out. It was really great to see that. Uh, I appreciate your sending that to us. I thoroughly enjoy that. And uh, finally, I want to say to uh, the members here that are going off the board, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed working with all of you and know that uh, you will be around doing things to help uh, all that you can do to make sure that our students in the school system have a rewarding and enjoyable day. I know we haven't seen the last of any of you, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mrs. Tanya Laird-Lewis. Okay, good evening. Um, I did write some notes, not as many as others, because the first, <laughs> the, the first thing I put on um, for my board report was to speak from the heart. Um, and that's how you have to make your decisions. So for the new board members that are coming on, I want to let you know that number one, you need to do what's right. You need to do what's best for the children. You need to make sure that you're not making decisions based on um, your own selfish attributes. We have 15,000 plus students in this county that are relying on you, not just you, collaboratively, the seven individuals that are gonna be up here. And another thing that I always tell myself when we were wearing our masks during COVID, I have a mask that had printed on the side, meet challenges head on, and greet them with a wink. And that's exactly what I would like to pass on, again, to those new members that are coming on. Meet those challenges. Stand up. Don't back down. You need to do what's right. You need to express your opinions. and need you to make sure that these other board members understand your concept. Are you going to get along all the time? Absolutely not. We have not. I will be the first one to admit that. Um, it has, it has been very challenging being on the board as the only individual with students in the school system. So with that being said, 
I have absolutely no regrets on not one decision I made, not one comment, not one child that I stood up for, not one parent that I stood up for, not board members that I stood up for. So if you're brave enough to say goodbye, life will bring you a brand new hello. And I told myself that I would not get upset during this. Um, but for nearly five years, this has been my life. This is the first time I'm going to be able to do those things again with my children, go into the schools, volunteer for junior achievement. Um, so I'm leaving here today with no regrets, and I have absolutely gained a wealth of knowledge that I will treasure along with the friendships of the individuals that are in executive positions, the board positions with us, Dr. Hanlon, who has talked me off a cliff many, many times. Um, Dr. Briggs over here, who has given me some tips from, you know, way back when we were younger to just push through and persevere. My time on the board has been a fantastic learning experience. I'm thankful for the skills that I have acquired, the things that I have learned, the policies that I have helped create, implement, and programs, um, pushing for things that we know that is best for our students. And that's what I want to leave here with, is letting everyone know that those who are leaving the board, we are leaving, but we are definitely leaving with memories. We are leaving with um, thoughts that we have done the very, very best that we can do for the school system. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. I would like to thank Don, Mike, Ta Tanya, and Ann for their years of service on this board. Each of these people are unique in themselves. And I do a lot with word association and people. Don is a proud veteran, fellow veteran, which I'm proud of also. Don, I thank you for your service and for your service here. Michael's got one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen in somebody. I mean, he really feels for his job and what's going on. Tanya, spit and fire. <laughs> right off, I've learned that about her, spit and fire. <laughs> And wisdom, the wisdom of being in the school system for many years. <laughs> okay, 41 years. <laughs> okay. And uh, so they're each unique, and if you listen to them, you'll, you'll learn. And I've learned a lot for them over that time. So uh, thank you all for uh, service, and I'm uh, happy retirement. <laughs> uh, I'd like to also tell you about my seat. You see, my seat is unique. I don't mean being a board member or being vice chair or chair. I get to sit next to the student <laughs> government <laughs> presidents. And I get to share with them some things that the other board members don't. For instance, as we were going over the, uh, the agenda, Naya noticed that on the consent items, we just approved them, and she said, did you just skip over all of them? <laughs> <laughs> so I told her no, and then I explained to her that we sat down at meetings to discuss these issues. We asked many questions, resolved uh, any problems that came up, and, there, and then we came up here and we approved what we uh, already uh, went over. So uh, that's what's unique about this seat. And they're very observant. <laughs> uh, parents, I really need you to get involved in the school system. Uh, there are events that you really need to attend. Uh, your PTAs, uh, get involved in your PTAs and find out what's going on in your schools. There are policies that are in place that they do change. Uh, you don't notice them too much, and it takes time for this to happen. It doesn't happen real quick. On a recent policy change, it, it took a little while to get it done, but in the procedure, it was changed to the advantage 
of the students and the parents. So when you have a problem, uh, please refer to the policies that we have and understand what is going on. And then if you can't get it resolved, then you know, go to your principals and your superintendent and finally the board members. So uh, that's all I have. Thanks for, com for coming. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Murray. Mr. Fitzgerald requested to go last, so then okay. you, then me, then Mr. Fitzgerald. I'm going to be brief because a lot of things have been said, but um, yeah, I have it on. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm going to be brief. A lot of things have been said, but I want to thank uh, everyone for allowing me to serve on um, the Wicomico County School Board for the last five years. Um, the last two have been as your vice chair. It um, sort of ends a long time career for me as an educator, and I have enjoyed every minute of it. My main focus is the students. Um, I thoroughly enjoy the student government, the pledge, but the kids themselves and things they're doing and listening. Because I said it at one of my board reports this past year, sometimes our students act more mature than adults do in their thinking process. And I do mean that sincerely. Um, I have seen many changes um, in education. It's like a 360 degree turn coming back and forth. As I promised, I am going to be brief. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I enjoyed serving under Don, coming on the board as president, and of course, um, Mr. Malone and Dr. Hanlon. Appreciate you being here tonight as superintendent, and of course you, Dr. Stauffer, as you continue. For the new board coming in, I have a message for you. Take it for what you want. But the most important thing is congratulations for you in stepping on to a duty like this. I think it's important. Make sure that you focus on all students' best interest. And I emphasize all students' best interest. Forget the politics. Lay the signs down and make the best choices for these students. And most importantly, be a people person in your community to everyone. Listen, comment as you feel need to, research and get back with people. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. As I said, Mr. Fitzgerald will, I guess you're batting cleanup. Number seven, well, we'll consider that cleanup. He's after me. So since the last meeting, I attended a particularly interesting event at uh, Glen Avenue School where they had uh, Dr. Khalila Ali, which is Muhammad Ali's widow. And they, she did a lot of conver conversing and discussing kindness. It's pretty cool for me because I grew up watching Muhammad Ali box, and then as a teenager I watched him. So it was really nice. And for me, Glen Avenue is where I went to elementary school uh, many years ago and she thought that was very interesting when I shared with her I used to walk to this school but uh, I guess that was in the 60s probably but anyway it was a while ago also attended some uh, what's so funny <laughs> also attended some chamber award the chamber awards lunch the CTE dinner we many of us did community foundation awards and so you know we had, had went to many events over the last month but my report tonight board report is going to be focused on what I believe the seven of us accomplished since 2018 when we were elected and or appointed and then were elected. I won't let the four members who are retiring go away without a quote because that's kind of been my trademark. So I know Mr. Palmer relishes these moments. <laughs> Individual commitment to a group effort, that is what makes a team work, a company work, a civilization work, and I would add made this board work. Teaming up with Dr. Hanlon and now Dr. Stauffer and their entire staffs, teachers, everyone, we did some really great things. And I'm going to name a few of them. Some of them were named in the uh, tributes tonight. We built New Beaver Run Elementary, completing Mardella's renovations, implemented historic salary increase for teachers, implemented teacher retention bonuses, completed air conditioning in all the schools, completed the securing of all school vestibules, etc. We also successfully navigated through the dreaded pandemic. While there will always be questions about how we handled certain facets of the pandemic, 
One thing I'm certain of, all seven of us made decisions with the best interests of all students, staff, and community members in mind. We made those decisions based on the information in hand at that time, and as others have said, I don't regret the decisions we made. We did it with the best interest of all in mind. So I'm honored to have served with each and every one of you on this board. I'm proud to have that we, how we handled many situations and how we conducted ourselves. You all made great contributions to the good of the Wicomico County public school system. Thanks for allowing me to be your chairman for a few years and colleague all these years. And as the old TV star Bob Hope used to say as he closed his shows, thanks for the memories. Mr. Fitzgerald. Paul will be reading Mr. Fitzgerald's comments. To the Wacomico County Board of Education. As I sit here writing this letter, and this is in Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald's words, and reflecting on my years of service to the students, staff, and administration of the Wacomico County Public School System, I will tell you, it has been my honor to serve on the Wicomico County Board of Education. For the past 13 years, I have tried to do my very best for all of you. In the beginning, there was a steep learning curve. I tried to listen and read and learn. It took many months, but eventually I began to feel more comfortable and began asking questions and offering suggestions. For me, it has never been about politics. It's been about what is best for the students. As the journey continued, I gradually took on more responsibility and was elected by the board members to vice president for two years, then president chairman for five years. I want to thank a few people who have been helpful to me along this journey. First, Dr. Donna Hanlon for serving her strong leadership and vision for the Wacomico County public school system over the last six years and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. To Dr. Micah Stauffer for his guidance and leadership since coming to the board. Dr. Rick Briggs from the first day I met him to now for his friendship and professionalism. Kim Miles for always being a positive voice in the room. Dr. Brian Ragar, we did not get to work together closely but I have it on good authority that you are a good guy, so I thank you for that. <laughs> Bonnie Walston, my good friend, what can I say? You are a rock star for the special ed students in Wicomico County and the state of Maryland. To Desmond Hughes, early in my tenure on the board, I think I must have been a real pain, but I don't know how you do it. Director of Transportation is a very demanding job, and you have done it well. We have more. To Eric Gosley, wow, you do a great job feeding our students. Bob Langan, thanks for bringing Wicomico County to the forefront in the technology world. We have come a long way as a result of your leadership. Dr. Vince Pavick, Vat Pavick, thank you for all you do to make sure we have a knowledgeable and efficient human resources department. To Jesse Reed, you learned well from Bruce Ford, and under your leadership, we have not missed a beat in the finance department. To Bob Souza, thank you for keeping our facilities clean and our grounds well-maintained. To Liesl Ashby, it has been an honor to work with you and Joe Vignali for many years, and want to, I want to thank you for being a true professional. For most of my years as vice president and president, there was one person who did keep me straight. That was Nikki Vestal. Nikki, I want to thank you for all you did for me and my family. I'm sure I've missed some people, and for that I apologize and thank you for all you did. Now, I cannot leave without mentioning some board members. Gene Malone. I can't thank you enough for stepping to the plate when I had my health issues. Your leadership and guidance at the BOE has been invaluable. Keep up the good work. 
you are doing. To Alan Brown, thank you also for your leadership and your guidance. John Palmer, I believe you have also listened and learned during your tenure on the <laughs> BOE. <laughs> Keep learning. Michael Murray, Tanya Larry Lewis, and Ann Suthowski, it has been a pleasure working with you. Thank you for all you do. And finally, I want to give a special thank you to Jesse Driver for all you do to keep the athletic field looking great and well-maintained. In closing, let me say it has been hard not being able to talk for the last three years, but I believe I have learned to listen before opening my mouth. In the past eight months, a few people have used social media to spread false information about me. The Optimist Club has a sentence in the Optimist Creed that goes like this. Promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. Again, thank you for the pleasure of serving the Wicomico County Board of Education for 13 years. Mr. Don Fitzgerald. Wow, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone and for all your board reports. Thank you to all those who attended. And with that, we'll adjourn and safe travels home. Thank you.